Welcome, everyone, to this week's edition of the Commercial Real Estate 101 Meetup Group. Uh, for those of you guys who are tuning in for the first time, we started this group back in April of 2020, somewhat in response to COVID. Uh, kind of everyone was online, so we figured why not start a, a forum and discussion uh, to be able to discuss a variety of different commercial real estate topics. And today, I'm honored to have Darren uh, to hop on the call with us. We had a chance to connect through another podcast that I run, the Commercial Real Estate Academy podcast, and he's just a, a, a commercial real estate powerhouse, uh, in particular, uh, you know, in the Australia and and really the the Oceania region. So we're really excited to host you today. It is December where you're located. So uh, happy uh, early Christmas, I guess. Welcome to the future. Um, my <laughs> my my daughter's very excited because uh, I don't know if you have these in the states, but those calendars that you can open up a, a yes. chocolate every day mm -hmm. starts on the first of December, right? So we put it up um, on the kitchen bench last night, and she climbed up on there. She's three years old, so she's. She's she's improving her climbing skills, but we had to explain to her that tomorrow, as in today, is the day that she can start opening a chocolate every day. So that's exciting. It's hard to tell a three year old to weigh today, right? <laughs> I imagine this is the there's a lot of it. It's uh, look, she's at that stage where she's starting to talk back to us now, or, or talk in a good way, as in with yeah. full sentences, and you know she's got some opinions of things. So um, it's exciting, but uh, yes, um, she's easily tempted. That's awesome. Well, Darren, again, uh, honored to have you on the show, as I said before. So let's just go ahead and get started. One of the things that we typically like to do when we first get started is to learn a little bit more about the person. So if you don't mind kind of sharing a little bit about your backstory, I think that'd be awesome. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I'm I'm here in Australia, in Melbourne. Um, I worked in commercial real estate. Uh, I guess I still do as a uh, speaker and um, coach and uh consultant trainer to the industry um, but in the more traditional sense um, spent 20 years in commercial real estate uh, started with a firm called uh, Urbis JHD which is the JHD side which was consulting to retailers on how they can increase their turnover when they do uh, some sort of expansion or refurbishment of their supermarkets department stores or shopping centers um, then I moved into a valuation firm where I was the head of research and then um, I moved to JLL, which is um, one that your audience would know, um, was working in research in Melbourne for a couple of years. Opportunity came up to go overseas to work in Korea, which I did in 2007, which was the good old days before the global financial crisis. So, um, you know, they they flew me over there and showed me a good time and said, would you like to come? And I said, yes. So I did and uh, ended up staying there for 11 years. So um, moved into tenant representation, um, was leading leasing and tenant representation at JLL for a few years. CBRE then recruited me to be the country head of their business, which I did for a few years. Um, and then I came back to Australia in 2019 and only did a year back in Australia with JLL. And that was enough for me to realize that no longer want to be a broker, no longer want to be uh, an agent. And I think what the industry needs is um, in Australia, someone doing what it is that I'm now doing, which is providing, I guess, a bit of mentoring, coaching um, advice to the industry. There are a lot of residential um, real estate experts um, who are in this space in Australia, but no one was really doing much in commercial. And I'd seen people doing it in North America, and I knew that it could be a business, but I guess I had to sort of take the plunge and just go for it. And it's been about, um, I started it in April, 2020. So not the best time to start a business, um, but I started it and, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be four years in a few months. So, um, so far, so good. That's amazing. Yeah. So this podcast actually started in April of 2022. So it's April of 2020 also, sorry. Right. Um, so we were all bad we things, started, good things happen, right? All, all good things happen, right? And 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 I and I do appreciate everything that you shared regarding your background too, because you know you had such a unique experience in in being able to transact in markets that have a lot of different cultural have a lot of cultural differences. And I know on the you know podcast that we we had had previously, you had kind of explored some of those uh, differences from an East Asian perspective versus you know more of a Western perspective that that Australia has, and so. You know, obviously that's provided you with a great framework that you are able to use to, you know, advise your clients. And, you know, like you said, there there needs to be strong leadership in commercial real estate. And I'm glad you were able to kind of see that opportunity and then try to fill the void uh, that is in Australia. So yeah. And and leadership is the side that I sort of specialize in now. So probably 80% of the revenue for um the business 
comes from me working with commercial real estate business owners and helping them to uh, become the leader that they need to be in order to get the best out of the people who are inside their business, but also to be capable of uh, leading a business that's bigger than it currently is. Yeah. And, and, and the, the problems you have when you're a one person operation versus a multi person operation, again, it just adds to complexity. So having someone like you uh, to be able to kind of bounce ideas off of, obviously, you've had a lot of leadership experience at the highest level. So uh, that's really great that, that to hear that. So one of the things I'm kind of curious about is obviously this particular podcast is focused on kind of the future uh, 2024, you know, 2023 for many people, as we talked about a little bit offline. It has been yeah. a tough year, uh, especially if you've been in certain verticals within commercial real estate. I, I can I, I know many investment sales brokers that have had a really tough go in 23, just with it where interest rates are at. I guess what are some of the most common, you know, issues that your clients have approached you uh, with in 2023? And you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of those, and then we can dive into some of the solutions or traits that we can, you know, potentially leverage to improve our 24. Yeah, I think. Um... Probably the biggest thing is that it takes a lot more effort to get things done than it previously did. And just the amount of work that's required to um, work with a vendor on pricing, for example, and uh, just to get them to the point where they're willing to sign an authority to bring something to market. Because we're, we're at a stage where I don't think that there are many vendors who are uh, desperate, if you like. Um, there, there might be a few who sort of need the cash, um, but it's not at that sort of stage where people are selling out of pure necessity in in the, in the overall. Um, so a lot more work's required to get the actual transaction to market on the vendor side, to educate the vendor about what's going on in the marketplace, but also to drum up buyers or um, to, if you're leasing, to, to find tenants to bring into um, the process. So it used to be that you'd run a process and you'd get inquiry without really even trying. So um, nowadays it is much, much different. I attended an auction yesterday and it wasn't very well attended. And uh, this is something that I think is going to sort people out um, from you know the people who have just been sort of riding the wave as opposed to ones who are willing to do the work. Um, that's required to get stuff done. So, you know, I, I re reread um, Grant Cardone's 10X um, recently. And I'm not the hugest Grant, Grant Cardone fan, but, you know, I like to sort of check out different things. And the, the point that he makes about, you know, people underestimate the amount of effort required to get stuff done, right? That's one of the key points of the book. And I think that that is what has been going on this year. People have been underestimating um, the amount of effort that it takes to get things done because previously it's been much easier to get things done compared to what's been going on, particularly, I think, since about the middle of this year. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, almost on the dot, like you had mentioned, middle of this year, it has become a lot more difficult. And I've seen many deals fall apart uh, near the finish line. And whether that's the lender just deciding that they want to modify the terms in order to make it so that, you know, they have to bring more more liquidity to the, the actual transaction or, you know, maybe vent uh, sellers or like you said, not necessarily in a desperate spot. So, you know, if they want to sit on the building because they want to hit a certain price, they're going to sit on the building. And if you're not going to have a bit of get a buyer to commit to that that price, then obviously no no transaction occurs. And so, you know, I, I agree with you. I think that for a lot of people that that has been the case. And I think like you had mentioned, understanding that, you know, in the past we've had situations where we've had a lot of wind in the sails. So it's it was very easy to get things done for many, many times. And I think a lot of people got, you know, complacent about the fact that, you know, this is a profession where our job is to get us get the transaction to the finish line. So, you know, before in 2021, 2022, when interest rates were three or 4%, you could literally list something in fact, in particular, if it was multifamily industrial, and it was reasonably priced, you would, you would essentially get a bidding war and be able to sell the property, you know, without any issue. But nowadays, it's just becoming a lot more difficult to do that. And I think having like a perspective of that, and understanding that times, it's real estate is cyclical over time, we're eventually going to hit uh, a period of time where it becomes a lot more easier to transact uh, is good perspective to have. So, yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's a little bit about um, survival and staying in the game during these tough times, right? You've mm -hmm. got to sort of uh, 
keep on standing, keep in the game because um, the better times will come. Um, yes, it's disheartening. Yes, it's frustrating. Um, it can lead to a loss of confidence. Uh, you can lose some momentum. But you've got to also have a look at, you know, what is your overall trajectory? So um, if you're only a few years in and you think, oh, maybe I'm not cut out for this, just remember that you have made a lot of progress. You do have accumulated knowledge. Maybe you haven't seen what is going on now before, but this is your first stage of this type of cycle. And everyone in their career is going to experience this stage of a cycle. And then the next time it happens, which it will, because cycles generally go for seven to 10 years, then you'll be much better prepared. And you'll look back on this time and you'll be able to remember, oh, yes, I remember that. That This is what's going on. Here's a way that I can advise my clients. Here's a way that I can work with buyers. Here's a way that I can manage myself. And I know that I'm better equipped to get through to the other side. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So, you know, kind of in that same type of vein, you know, of the people that you've worked with that have had the most success, what are some of the more common traits that they share and how can some individuals kind of replicate that in their business so that they can hopefully have a similar success? Yeah, I think they, uh, they don't panic. Um, they have resilience, probably resilience, I guess might be the word, right? So, um, you've got to just stay strong. Um, and, uh, you've got to, I think, not get too sucked into thinking that, okay, the only, I'm speaking more from a leadership perspective as well, thinking mm -hmm. that, okay, now that this is happening, I've just got to go in and do all the things because otherwise it's not going to be done. You've got to have a, a little bit of discipline, I think, to trust in the people in your team, to realize that there is still also a business to run. So you've got to keep working on the business as opposed to working in the business, so it's not about doing the same things as they had been done before, but it's just about remembering that the things that still need to be done need to be done. Um, there are always these core things that your business needs in order to operate. And yeah, I think as I think about some of the people I'm speaking to at the moment, um, yeah, sometimes people can just get, I don't know if it's distracted or um, it's kind of like they are, uh, hyper concerned that if they don't do the things and they won't get done. And I guess there's a little bit of truth to that, but you've got to also trust your team. And I think the role of the leader is to support your team, to be that person who has the experience to relay that, Hey, I've been through this before. This is what it's like. This is the things that you can do in order to get through it and to help your people to perform at their best during these times, as opposed to, you know, spiraling into a panic, um, changing the way that you've always done things, because then you become I guess, a little bit unpredictable. Um, and when you're unpredictable and when you're doing different things, I think people in your business, your clients and other people will say, oh, this is different. Um, this is not good. What's going on? And mm -hmm. I think that that could actually contribute to the problem as opposed to detract from it. So, um, yeah, I think resilience is, is probably one of those things. And, you know, there are a lot of things that you can do to be resilient um, that can be around your... Uh, personal choices that you make in your life. Um, it could be continuing to take your holidays, for example. Um, and yeah, it can just being calm under pressure um, and you know not sort of losing yourself in the moment. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it, you know, resilience and discipline. I mean, you know, mm. I, the you know, I'm I'm sure there's there's many books and 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 leadership uh, podcasts out there that talk about the importance of having a routine and kind of sticking to something over a long period of time. There's a book uh, called The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, which I know we talked about in the past. And that's kind of my, you know, not necessarily Bible, but I, I that, that book, for whatever reason, just kind of hit me when I was 23 years old. And I read that book and it just kind of changed my perspective on everything. And then it, it's pretty much says that small, positive, consistent action over time add up, adds up to massive results. So if you do something on a daily basis, yeah, the results may not come right now. I mean, as we kind of had described, you know, the environment that we're in is is not necessarily conducive to, you know, high volume as far as transaction concern. For, for many investment sales brokers out there that are listening, you know, it's dropped off, you know, 60 to 70% in some markets. So, you know, obviously there's less of a pie right now, but if you perform the consistent action that you obviously need to do to maintain a, 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 a solvent business, when you come out of that period, when we come out of this period, and we're going to come out of this period pretty soon, if I, I believe, I mean, really 24, we're set up for, for I believe, a pretty solid year. Um, so again, weather the storm, be calm. And over time, 
you'll you'll obviously uh, lead to uh, greater things. So. And then I was kind of curious about, so, you know, obviously we have a, a range of different uh, people who listen to the podcast, you know, as far as the demographics for the podcast, we tend to skew somewhat younger, you know, in the 28 to 34 range is kind of the, the, the highest demographic. And then it starts to get into the 34 to 44 range. So there are some people who are kind of newer in their career and then there's people who are more established. So there's a two part question that I have for you, you know, Alrighty. The the first the first part of that question is related to the newer agents, those that are like we had described a couple of years in the business. Maybe they just started, you know, 2022. You know, they're kind of in the tail end of this covid, you know, crazy cycle that we had where everything was just kind of flying off the shelf. So it's already kind of hard to to navigate those waters. I guess what are some of the things that you would recommend uh, that they do some steps they can take to set themselves up for a great 2024? And then we'll we'll dive into the more established professionals after that. Yeah, so I guess start to build your pipeline now is probably the sort of core thing to do um, to realize that the year that you have in 2024 is somewhat determined now. So even if people, and, you know, in the chat, there are a few questions coming in about, you know, people wanting to wait and so forth. Well, um, you can still have conversations with people. Um, if people are telling you that now's the not the right time, well, let's get ourselves a pipeline of at least meetings to do in the first couple of months of 2024. Um, a good acronym that I learned recently is BAMFAM. BAMFAM is um, book a meeting from a meeting. So whenever you're speaking to someone and they say to you, oh, yep, we'll we'll talk about that later, uh, pin them down to a time and a date and then secure the next meeting because that is the best way for you to continue that conversation as opposed to be in some no man's land where you're just chasing each other and trying to lock people in. Book, book a meeting from a meeting is always a good thing to do um, uh, for moving transactions forward, but also even in this earlier stage when you're just building pipeline. Um, so what else would I say for those people? Um, uh, probably content is something that you can be working on at any time. Um, you know, expand while others are contracting, right? So I think a lot of people will see now's just not a good time. I'm just going to come back in 2024. Uh, 2023 is over, right? Well, it's not over. And while it might be too late to run a whole process and uh, settle a property between now and the end of the year that you haven't started. It's certainly not too late to start building up your personal brand and to um, do the work that's going to get you recognized as the, uh, you know, the go-to sort of trusted voice in your market. So uh, a lot of um, our older friends in the different cohort uh, perhaps aren't as uh, interested or capable in that area. Um, but you can do that um, not only on LinkedIn, but also, you know, on Instagram and even um, on TikTok. Um, I think Instagram is probably the one where I'm seeing one of my clients in particular um, is doing a really great job on Instagram with building up um, his personal brand. Um, he's got some videos that have gotten like a million views. Um, so doing really, really well. Uh, so I reckon Instagram's possibly... Um, an undertapped resource for people in commercial real estate. Again, you look at people in residential, they do really, really well um, in Instagram and Instagram is no longer for kids, right? It's a lot of the demographic is of people that we want to be talking to are, are definitely on Instagram. Um, the other one, I guess, is just all of this AI stuff, right? Um, and you are probably better placed to understand how to use all that stuff if uh, you are in a younger cohort than you are in an older cohort. And um, if you are younger, my advice would be um, don't be a cheapskate when it comes to chat GPT. Pay the $20 a month and get the plus version. Uh, because when you've got the plus version, you can start using all of the features that come with chat GPT in terms of setting it to always talk in your voice. You can create your own GPTs that are specifically for different types of functions. So you just set it up once. And then, uh, you know, as an example, you might say that this GPT, which is my own personal GPT, is for industrial listings in a certain area. You put in uh, in a PDF, like 10 examples of how you want it to sound. And you say, whenever I type in the particulars of a property, I want you to reproduce an online advertisement in the format that I've taught you. And then boom, it'll do it, right? So these are all of these sales administrative uh, marketing tasks that need to be done, but that can be done super fast. If you believe that your time is worth less than 
uh, 50 cents an hour, then, um, sorry, if you believe it's worth more than 50 cents an hour, then definitely you should invest in something that can save you probably 40 hours a month. And that would be um, chat GPT plus. So that's, that's a amazing. few things. Is that? Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And, and yeah, oh, absolutely. And they're super actionable too. And, and, and on, the, on the content side, I know you do a phenomenal job on the content front on a variety of different platforms. And, you know, I, I, even in my local market, I'm I'm big into YouTube. I'm big into LinkedIn. I've been in a lot of other you know social platforms, and it's already started to bear fruit. Granted, it's been a three to four year process, so I wouldn't say that any type of content creation is going to bear fruit in two months, three months, five months. But you know, I don't think it's ever a bad idea to begin the process of creating and establishing yourself as a thought leader in in some capacity. And so, you know, I appreciate you sharing that content, uh, you know, generation idea and chat GPT. I I've used it many times where it's like, come up with 10 or 15 ideas for content for commercial real estate. And it'll pull up all these different ideas. Cause that's another pe thing that a lot of people, you know, have issues with as they say, Oh, I can't come up. I don't know what to come up with as far as content, but there's different ways that you can augment AI to help you, uh, with the process. So. Yeah. And you've, you've got to learn how to use chat GPT properly. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think a lot of the, the sort of news about it is, oh, it, it, it got this wrong. So therefore it's no good. Um, well, it's probably not the best um, place to get um, historical facts, perhaps. Um, but it is like a very good place to generate ideas. Um, like its language is actually quite good, um, but it's only as good as the prompts that you give it. So if you find that... Um, the reason why I think a lot of the stuff that ChatGPT produces is quite like it sounds a little bit spammy when it's written. That's because a lot of people write with spam language, right? So all that ChatGPT can learn is what's out there on the internet, what's published, and it just takes that and goes, this is what typically one would write when you're writing a LinkedIn post, when you're writing an online listing, and you know, when you're doing whatever. So what we need to do is then tell ChatGPT this is best practice. This is the tone of voice. This is the structure. This is the type of language that I would like you to reference when you are creating this piece of content for me. And then it will take the instructions that you've given it along with what it already knows uh, from being this huge, I guess, language model. And it will come up with something that is better than what it would come up with if you just asked it a basic question. And this is all about um, communication as well, right? So mm -hmm. your ability to speak to chat GPT, even though it is a, a bot essentially, will actually um, improve your ability to communicate with people. So the better that you can get chat GPT to produce what you want, that shows that you're a good communicator, which means that you'll also be able to hopefully, um, you know, without sounding kind of like you're just using people, you'll be, you'll be able to get people to do what you want because you'll be communicating clearly and in a way which um, helps people understand what you're looking for. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Great advice. So the, kind of the, the second part to this question is, you know, there's another section of our, our audience as well that are much more established oh, yes. in their career. So for those individuals who are individual performers and they, they're performing at a high level, maybe the last few years have been the best years that they've ever had. And now they've kind of hit a lull. Uh, so, you know, for those individuals and also kind of your target audience, the people that you work with the most, the, the leaders of different organizations within the commercial real estate, maybe they have their own team or maybe they run their own individual organization and they're trying to navigate the murky waters that we're currently in. Uh, what are some of the steps that they can take today and going forward to make sure that they set themselves up for a great 2424 and beyond? It's probably about their leadership. Um, because, you know, there's, there's four ways that you can kind of create, um, leverage that you can produce more than just you're capable of producing in one day. And, um, it's either through money, it's, um, either through people, um, it's through technology or it's through content. And the most accessible way for us in commercial real estate, is still probably the one where we can actually create the most things to happen is by hiring people who can help us produce more. And you know, if we think about the three sort of things that we're doing in commercial real estate, we're generating leads, um, we're then converting those leads into revenue, um, and then we're also trying to create some sort of uh, leverage or, or scale um, through processes, through systems, or through people. And um, you've got to be a good leader if you want good people to work for you. 
So I think uh, understanding, you know, what is your zone of genius? So what is it that uh, you are good at, that you enjoy doing, and that you can get paid the most to do? Um, understanding what your effective hourly rate is. So if you can produce $500,000 in a year, your effective hourly rate is $250 an hour. So it's just your um, annual income divided by 2000. Well, if you're spending your time doing $20, $50, even uh, $75 an hour tasks, you're effectively taking away time for you to be able to continue growing your income. So I think a lot of people feel like, well, I can just do it myself. I'm better off doing it myself. No one can do it better than me. If you want something done properly, do it yourself. All of these kind of beliefs that people have, that's stopping you from making um, more money. Um, so if if making more money is what is important and to boil it down, it is pretty important for a lot of commercial real estate agents and brokers. And I know we make money to do things with, whether it support our family, support important causes, to make an impact in the world, to live a better life. Um, but if we if that's part of our goals, then we need to be willing to give up some of that control and to bring other people in so that we can actually produce more because there's always going to be a limit on the amount that you can produce on your own. It, it might be one or two million dollars, um, but you will reach a limit unless you start to bring in good people who can help you create more of that leverage. And, you know, pe- the, the people that you attract will be a reflection of you. And the people that you retain will be a reflection of you. So I think the best thing that you could do based on your question, which was a high performer who's producing a lot, what can they do? Well, it's to work on themselves, to work on their leadership, to look at their um, blind spots. So to have a think about, you know, what what is it that someone would say about me um, over a couple of drinks when they didn't think I was listening, when they were talking about their boss? What would they say? Um, what would they say if the company did an anonymous survey, uh, an engagement survey or a 360, and they were asked, you know, what, do, what would I like to see my boss do less of? What do I want my boss to stop doing? Um, those are the real big levers for you to, um, to, to sort of activate for improvement. Um, a lot of people say, you know, you've got to um, focus on your strengths. And focusing on your strengths will allow you to then um, let other people do the things that you don't want to do. But also you've got to recognize, are there any weaknesses which are actually detracting from your ability to produce more? And um, most of us have those. Um, You know, I learnt the hard way what some of mine were. And, uh, you know, the easier way to learn them is um, through self-reflection and hopefully um, mitigating them before they impact your ability to um, attract and retain good people. Yeah, no, and I think it's a common trait, you know, you know, I'm sure a lot of people who are high performers in any industry, they got that way because they are somewhat of a type personalities. They they're very hard charging. They like to get the, some cert, certain things done the right way. And it, there is a hurdle sometimes that's that, you know, you've done a certain thing a certain way for a long period of time. You've been very successful at it. But in order to you reach the next level, you have to be able to link relinquish control, which for again. Is not an easy thing to do, especially when, especially in the early stages of that relinquishment of control, because it requires a lot of effort for you to be able to sit down with someone to train them. And most of the time, they're not going to be able to do it as well as you, at least starting out and maybe ever. But it does. But at the end of the day, if you're able to bridge that divide and at least get them close enough to where they can do the task competently, now you free yourself up to be able to do uh, other things that are much more valuable to helping helping you grow your business over time. So, um, uh, great insight. Yeah. I really appreciate that. So, yeah. you know, the, I think um, good processes are documented, they're simplified, and then they're followed, right? That's all you need to do. You just need to document what it is that you're doing, simplify it so it's easy for someone else to pick up and do, and then you need to make sure that the other person is doing it. And once you've done those three things, then your job is to see, um, this again sounds a little bit bad, but it's just it's the way it is. What's the lowest amount of money that I could pay for this to be done to the required standard? And that's actually a good thing for your people because you're constantly looking to elevate people's roles. You're looking to uh, have people do more important, strategic, client-facing, revenue-generating tasks. Um, so I guess another trend that is important, Raphael, is um, you know the use of virtual assistants, right? Um, so... I'm guessing you probably use a virtual assistant. 
Um, I use a virtual assistant. A few of my clients do, but still there is a lot of resistance to using virtual assistants for uh, whatever reason that is. And there's, you know, a whole list of reasons, beliefs that people have about, you know, is it um, ethical to hire someone, um, you know, in a, in a lower cost economy to do things that I would hire someone in my own country for this amount. Um, it's totally ethical. It's totally fine. In fact, you can make it more ethical by the way that you work with that person by being a great boss by, you know, you can choose to pay a dollar an extra an hour if you want to. And that's a huge difference for that person. Um, so I would add that, um, you know, looking to always elevate people's roles and to make sure that we're not overpaying for certain tasks. Because ultimately, if you pay someone, um, you know, let's call it $50 an hour, $100,000 a year, but you've got them doing $20 an hour tasks, they're not going to be fulfilled. Um, they're going to get bored. They're going to look for better opportunities. And if you're not giving people the opportunity to grow, then they most of the time, people who are ambitious, people who have um, motivation, people who want to be the best version of themselves, well, they're going to go somewhere where they can be that. And um, that's that's why I think it's your duty to always look to um, have people operating within their zone of genius and to be um, you know, pushing down those lower cost tasks to people um, who are within that that pay range. Absolutely. And, and you know, it, it creates a, a starting point for someone and you hope your hope is that you start off at a, a lower task. Right. And then you could eventually work your way up to other opportunities. And so um, I appreciate that insight. So we have one last question, then we will open up to Q&A because we're starting to get a lot more uh, questions in the chat box, which I'm excited to kind of dive into. Uh, the last cool. question I have, last question I have for you, Darren, before we dive into this is what are some of the best resources that people can leverage in order to kind of set themselves up, like I said, for 2024, uh, you know, either publications, books, podcasts, whatever you think would be a value for for our audience? Well, um, we didn't set up this question beforehand, <laughs> but that seems like a tee up for me just to promote all my own stuff, right? Absolutely, absolutely right? Um, so I'll yeah. do a little bit of that, and mm -hmm. then I will talk about, I guess, in a more general sense. Um, so I'm going to be hosting a session um, about 10 days from now where we're going to look at ways for commercial real estate agents to win in 2024. Um, your uh, listeners and viewers are invited to go to cresuccess.co slash 2024, They can register for that. And in that session, um, we're going to talk about the four things that I think are going to be important for commercial real estate agents to get ahead of. And also the one thing that you can do to prepare yourself for that trend. Um, the other thing that we're going to do as part of that session is that everyone who attends that session, I'm going to give them free access to a GPT that I've created, um, which is all about doing one of those things I talked about before, which is writing really good copy for online advertisements for commercial real estate um, listings. So um, that is one thing that you can do. Um, I think more generally, um, read more, right? You've got to read more. Um, if you don't like reading, um, listen to audiobooks. If you don't like listening to audiobooks, watch stuff on YouTube. There is so much good free entertainment, uh, no, infotainment, um, edutainment um, out there. And, you know, you've got to make a commitment to improve yourself. I you put me on the spot a bit. So I'm just trying to think of some of the oh, no um, books that I've read. Um, you know, I talked about 10X. I think that that's a good one to go through. Um, if you haven't read it, um, I would really actually, actually, you know what, I put a list of books together um, at cresuccess.co slash books. There is 10 books there that I recommend. And every year um, I do an episode about the um, books that I recommend that people can read over the holidays. So if it's not too rude, I might just look that up right now of what my my next recommendations are. Would, would that be okay, Raphael? Please, yeah, please do. I mean, yeah. I, I'm always looking for great books. I have the I do Audible a lot, and I have the credits that I get every month, and so I'll probably download yeah, 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 a few yeah. of those. I do that too. I've actually I didn't like it so much before, but now I do like it. Um, all right, I found it, and of course I forgot about Alex Formosi. Do you like Alex Formosi? I love him. Yeah, he's amazing. Yeah, really. so I love his stuff. I've really got into his stuff this year. So $100 million authors, um, you know, is his book from a couple of years ago. Um, I haven't fully finished $100 million leads yet. So I, I, would, I would recommend it, but I haven't personally finished it. So I'd say $100 million offers is really, really good. Um, another book I'm recommending this year is The Little Red Book of Selling 
by Jeffrey Gitmer. Do you know that one? I've heard of it. I have not read it though. Very, very good. You know, value-driven selling, um, building relationships, uh, you know, understanding the buyer, very sort of no-nonsense sort of advice. Um, and the third one is a book called, uh, it's an Australian book um, called Combo Prospecting. And it's by this guy called Tony Hughes. He's pretty active on LinkedIn, so you could follow him. And the main thing that he teaches is like multi-channel prospecting. So, you know, when we pick up the phone, we also send an email. Um, like always trying to go boom, boom, hit people on two channels and create that sort of uh, multiple effect to have more impact when you are uh, doing your um, prospecting activity. That's amazing. No, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to download that book for sure because I think that would be of, of extreme value uh, to the audience. So, all right. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, so we have plenty of uh, messages in the chat box we're excited to get to. If you guys are watching this on LinkedIn as well, feel free to type away. We're going to go ahead and try to answer as many questions as we can within the hour. So uh, to start off, Jose, hey, Jose, he, he ask. Uh, so these are some of the common objections that he's getting in the marketplace. Uh, this okay. is not this is not a great market to sell. I'm waiting for the market to turn. Why would I invest in CRE when treasuries are offering an, offering an attractive return? Now and then he also says now it's now it's a need to drill down on managing expectations and bridging the gap between buyer and seller expectations. Mm. Yeah. So, so I guess questions regarding the objections and then maybe ways that you know you would you would advise clients to kind of handle some of these uh these concerns that people have um so on the one hand um i think it's about what you believe right if you believe these things to be true then you're going to have trouble um convincing somebody that otherwise is the case so if you believe that it's not a great market to sell um for that seller based on their profile um, then probably you're not going to do a very good job of convincing them otherwise. Um, it could be that for some of your uh, clients, they have a long-term relationship with or that you want to maintain a long-term relationship with, that the best thing for them to do might not be to sell right now. So you need to consider that. Um, but there might be reasons why now is a good time for them to sell. And I think that you need to be able to come up with those compelling reasons, understand the more that you understand what their motivations are, what their circumstances are, um, what else is going on in the marketplace, I think the better equipped you are to handle that objection. Because, um, you know, some, some objections are actual genuine reasons, and then some of them are just uh, obstacles to you getting the sale. Um, so I think determining whether they are objections or whether they are actual reasons for the transaction not to proceed is important. And if they are genuine reasons, then... I guess, you know, my advice would be don't push too hard if you want to maintain that relationship. Um, but I'm not saying that now is a terrible time to sell and you can't do any transactions because the evidence shows that there are transactions happening, right? So you need to sort of understand what is the motivations behind those transactions? What is going on there? Are there any similarities going on with that particular situation? What's going on with, you know, your particular clients? And then, um, and same with buyers, right? Well, buyers are looking at, purchasing now, even when treasuries perhaps are offering a more attractive return. You know, at the most basic level, there is such a thing as total return, right? Um, and, uh, you know, there are opportunities that are potentially available now that wouldn't be available when market conditions um, are more normal or more um, stable, if you like. Um, there are less buyers in the market right now which perhaps means there's less competition, which, um, you know, if you're a buyer is, is probably a good thing. Um, what, what about you, Raphael? What, what have you got on that? I, I agree. I, I couldn't agree more with you. I, th I think you really have to just understand the individual that you're talking to because yeah. you're right. In certain situations, if, 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 if they want to sell their property for top dollar and then just kind of get out of the market, then maybe right now is not a good time to sell. But if they're actively trying to buy something else, then that's what I would probably tell them. I say, well, you know, did you have a trouble finding stuff in 2020, 2021, 2022 when the market was super hot? I mean, this is a good opportunity in, in this environment to really have a much more, much broader selection of potential opportunities if you do decide to transition into something new. So, you know, again, and and that may not work for everyone. Like you said, it, it, you know, having an understanding of the person you're talking to and looking out for what you believe is the best interest of that person is really the best way to build relationships long-term. And this is a good opportunity as well in this environment to educate yourself on the market. So get familiar with 
you know, the year over year change, get familiar with all these different metrics that, you know, are, will showcase to the, the marketplace that you in fact are an expert in your market. So when you start getting out of this, you know, lull period, they're going to remember you. They're going to be like, Oh yeah, I remember that guy or gal that called me and they were saying, yeah, we had a transaction that happened over here, traded for 125 bucks a foot. You know, here's some of the metrics that we we're seeing in this marketplace. This is where the trends are going, you know, so becoming more of an educator as well is a good, is a good strategy to take. Um, cause again, yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, that's just kind of what I've done so far and, you know, it's worked decently well. I mean, again, I'm not saying that I've had, you know, I've, I've done very well this year, which is great knock on wood, but again, it's not necessarily like I could have not done better if, if the market conditions were where they were two years ago. So it's one of those things where I think it's just think putting in things into perspective and really just looking out for the best interest of your client. So 100% and like, you know, you got to think you're, you're in this for the long haul, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to retain these relationships, then, um, you know, find the reason why it might be a good time for them to sell. Uh, but if it's not, then it's not. But I, I really like what you said about their particular circumstances. Like, for example, um, look at their overall portfolio. Maybe it's, it's time for them. Maybe this is an underperforming asset anyway for their mm -hmm. portfolio and that's the time to sell. And this is just, you know, they've held it for a while. And you know, with this particular one, it's, it's time to let it go. And it's either here nor there if they do it last year, next year, or the year, or the year after, because they can you know, free up that capital and do something else with it. Yeah. Um, time, find the time, reason, like, time value of money. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's like, yes, you could be making money from this property, but what happens if you reallocate into something else that could potentially produce a better situation? And maybe it's an asset you want to own because there's plenty of people out there that own property and there's always that one or two or three properties that always just give them a headache and they always have to worry about them. And they're the ones that are just their problem properties. I mean, again, they're, they're, there's always a reason to sell. You just got to find the reason and hopefully it aligns with their interest in doing so. Yeah. So awesome. So uh, Dante, uh, don't, don't, I keep, I'm sorry. I don't mean to miss misspeak it. It's Dutine. Dutine, that's it. Yeah. And she comes on all the time. So I appreciate you, Dutine. Um, she said, thank you. Uh, and then we have some comments here as well from some of the audience as well. Jose kind of mentioned, I've seen the successful brokers get out of the negative mindset of the market and focusing on processes and systems than outcomes. Uh, they are seeing a down market opportunity to speak with owners just because they need they need information. So you're right. It kind of speaks to the education piece. Uh, just kind of keeping them abreast as what about what's going on. Um, another thing which I th I, I would love to hear your take on. Dotine mentioned always keep network the network mentality. Always be prepared. I guess have you seen uh, kind of advising uh, you know some of your clients and people that you work with to kind of get out there into different you know roles or potentially getting out there and you know joining organizations like what what are you what are you seeing on on your guys's side. So I guess um, what I sort of, what that triggered in my mind when I heard that, when I saw that comment there is just the need to be super prepared for every opportunity that comes up, right? So before you go along to a listing presentation, before you go along to um, any meeting, uh, making sure that you have totally prepared for that meeting because opportunities are probably a bit fewer and further between when there are when, you know, when we're in a market like it is now. So therefore mm -hmm. there is less excuse for you, one, not to be prepared for that meeting because you should have more time to prepare for that meeting. But two, you want to be prepared for that meeting because it's actually more important in the scheme of things. So, you know, anticipating what questions are likely to come up. Like you said before, being super um, aware of what's going on in the market, having information, being a source of knowledge, um, being someone that is seen as the expert. Um, understanding what is going on with that client, doing your research so you can ask intelligent questions. Um, I th that, that's what I think is important. And yeah, like with your network in general, um, I learned this thing recently um, called the Dream 100. I um, don't know if you've heard of it. I have not, um, no. It's, it's, I mean, a lot of, a couple of commercial real estate teams that I've been in have this sort of, you know, we've got our top 100, we've got our top 250, whatever it is. It's just sort of deciding, you know, these are, this Dream 100 is just a particular take on it. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's basically saying um, these are the 100 clients that we totally want to do business with. Some of them might be the clients that you're already doing business with, but you could do more with. And then there might be some that are not your client at all. And, you know, rather than, 
you know, prospecting 100 different clients every day or every week, we actually really focus and hone in on saying, these are the 100 that if we could get them would have a material impact on our business. And we just come up with a, um, a strategy, we can call it a cadence, if you like. So what is, you know, the, the, um, the points of contact that we'd want to have with this particular type of prospect in order to move them closer to becoming a client with us. So, um, you know, doing what you can to improve your relationship um, with your top 100 or top 250, it depends on the market that you're in as how many is going to be on your list is going to be really important. And just taking the time to understand and educate yourself about um, who they are and just start to see commonalities as well, right? Because probably your top 100 are going to have some similarities and, you know, then you can do things like create um, buyer personas or develop avatars. Um, when you're very clear on who it is that you want to be doing business with, then you can speak to that in your content and you can start picturing that person in your content. So therefore your content becomes more reson uh, resonates more with those people. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good comment, like networking and also being prepared. Awesome. So we have another question or more, more so a comment. Uh, those people who state uh, the down market is here to stay as an excuse. There's always a way to turn it into an opportunity. So I kind of couldn't agree more. I think there's uh, definitely you know, uh, some truth and step taste testament to that and kind of in that same vein and, and kind of leading back to what you were mentioning regarding the top 100 and kind of understanding who you're talking to, you know, tailoring that content to fix, to fixate on those individuals and preemptively figure out, you know, the questions to ask, like the frequently asked questions type thing. I have a, I have mm -hmm. a, a different pamphlets and brochures that I created that are specific to particular property owners. And I've also done things like write a couple books where, you know, they talk about the commercial leasing process or the commercial buying process, the commercial sales process. And I use that as marketing because now I can meet with a client and I, every time I meet with them, I'm like, oh, by the way, here's a book that I wrote that explains the process from start to finish. They may not ever read that book, but it has, you know, your name on it, your face on it. And then you could, you could create all different multi-directional content where it's like, okay, now I have a book. Now you can create an audible book. Now you can send them a link to the audible book. So like kind of your, your reference to the multi-directional type of hit rate. I mean, again, you just overshoot people so that you essentially become top of mind because that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that people understand, hey, talk to me when you decide you want to eventually transact. Um, How many books have you written now? Seven. Seven books. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I'm on number eight right now, but three in the commercial real estate space. So before you sell that building, before you buy that building and, and before you one? before you sign that lease, before you sign that lease. Yeah. And then that, and that's going to be a complete series so it's going to be uh before you develop that building so I'm, I'm getting more into the development side now so it's going to be like before you develop that building here's the book and then i'm going to have a book called before you invest in that building because at some point we're going to have to raise capital for different projects and so it's what do you ask sponsors like if you if, I, if i'm going to give you 50 grand or whatever that is whatever that number is what are some of the questions you need to ask them before you decide to commit to that 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 level and so it's just essentially going to be a a, a comprehensive guide and you know, I do all the audible books as well. So a lot of times when I meet with clients, it's like, I give them a copy of my book and then I send them a text and say, Hey, also, if you don't like to read or you don't want to read the book, here's a link to the audible book and it's me reading it. So now it further cements in their mind, you know, you as the expert. So, and again, that's just one way to approach it. You can do it a variety of different ways, but again, it's all about that just constant, you know, yeah. in your face type mentality. Omnipresent. Some people call it. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I um I haven't written a book, but um uh, what I would recommend to your um viewers and listeners is uh the the lesson there is that some people can do without having to write books is just sending people something physical, mm -hmm. right? And when you send something physical, it's a lot more difficult to delete that or throw it away than it is an email. Um, or a missed call or an SMS, right? When people receive something physical, it's probably not as common now to get physical things in the mail. Um, so it's going to be more sticky. And I, I find a client was telling me just the other day that um, he's been sending out all these newsletters for years and years. And sometimes he thinks, oh, you know, should I st still do it? It costs this much to send out these physical newsletters. But then occasionally he'll go into a uh, prospect's office and he'll see stacked in the corner with a dog ear clip um, is, you know, I don't know if it's hundreds, but tens and tens of his newsletters that are sitting there, right? A constant reminder that, uh, you know, he is the expert. So um, that's the the little nugget there, I reckon. I don't know if it's read, uh, write books because that is really hard work, I can imagine, but that's discipline. So well done. Yeah. But yeah, if you could, if you could send someone something physical, 
do that. If you're going to write a book, then gold star, massive gold star. If you write seven, <laughs> then, um, you know, you're an animal. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's the small positive consistent action, right? It's 250 to 500 words a day. It's kind of like making your 10 calls or making your 20 calls or whatever that is, whatever that number is for you. Over time, it adds up. So if you write 500 words a day, you'll have a 200 page book in hundred days. So it's, it's that, it's that type of, you know, mentality. But even if you don't necessarily even want to write a book, even writing a six page, you know, report about the market. Yeah. And then now that's a physical report. You can distribute it on, on LinkedIn with as a PDF format. Maybe you can mail it to your top prospects. And not only that, you can maybe even read it on, you know, and create this audio file. And now you can text it to people say, Hey, you know, I want to give you an art market update and I'm physically reading, you know, the, the different things about this. So there's different ways you can approach the, 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 the content generation process. What's your take Raphael on um, email marketing to your, to your list in general? How so often do you do it? I do it relatively regularly because every time I release a piece of content, I usually kick it out and you know, you get people who unsubscribe, but we built up a list. I have almost 3000 subscribe, like email recipients just through the, the different meetings that we do. So every time that people come on the zoom call or people engage in a variety of different ways, they get registered in the, in the email list. And so they just keep in touch over time. Well, what about for your, you know, your landlords and for your buyers and and for that once a month, community. once a month, I do once a do, month. New, new, okay. do newsletters. Um, and then, you know, more direct outreach is obviously more regular, but that's just, you know, I, I'm starting to get in. Actually, that's one of the things that I'm going to be doing for 2024 is I'm working on trying to do a little bit more automated on the mailing side for newsletters. And then I also, spoiler alert, I actually bought this machine that handwrites uh, letters. So I'm going to be experimenting. Personalization at scale. Exactly. So I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually uh, kind of experimenting with that. So we'll see how it all works out. I don't know how efficient it's going to be yet, but I'd love to be able to send out because personal handwritten notes are obviously extremely effective, but you know, they yeah. take a lot of time. So if there's ways we can, you know, obviously still deliver the right personalized content, especially if you augment it with AI and other things like that, and you can create really nice and personalized things that you can send to your top prospects that really have that personal touch. So um, so, um, I'm, I'm assuming shortly you, um, when you send people books, you inscribe them yourself, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And yes. I, and I physically, when I physically meet with clients, right. So, you know, you talk about setting up meetings, we'll set up a meeting, we'll get together. Uh, you know, if it's a property presentation, I'll usually bring like a, 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 a broker's opinion of value, kind of explain everything. And at the end I'll be like, Oh, by the way, here's a copy of my book. Now that I have before you sell that building, that's the book that I'm going to bring. And I'm gonna be like, Hey, Here's a copy. I, I signed it for you and everything else. And then after the meeting, you know, I, I send an email or a text and I say, thanks so much for meeting with me. I really appreciate all the, the time you spent it together. Uh, also, if, you know, I, I have an audible book format. Here's a link to the audible book, just in case you prefer to consume the content in that format. So again, it's just like over, over, over indulging them with information and it's worked immensely. I mean, the, the books have really helped me generate outside of just the book sales because book sales, you know, again, we're a niche industry. We're not going to make, you know, we're not gonna be the next JK Rowling, but it's definitely made me a lot of money through just doing, just winning business. And, and for us, winning business is going to be way more valuable than, you know, selling a book for, you know, 13 bucks. You may make six bucks on a book. Right. So. Mm. Amazing. Amazing. Um, Yes, even for non-book writers, there's good lessons in there just about, you know, taking the time to follow up with someone after a meeting, personalization. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I send someone a book, I always write, a, you know, something in the inside, not the inside That's cover, funny. but the first couple of pages just to make it personal, right? Absolutely. To let them know that it's not something that it's 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 for them. Um, Absolutely. Geez, maybe I should write a book. Well, <laughs> let's do it. 2024 for Darren, I'm telling you. Well, let me know, man. I'll anytime. I'm happy to provide whatever feedback and insights I can, but uh, for those I did start the, um, Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I Go. did start the LinkedIn newsletter this year. Right. And, mm -hmm. and what I realized was that from, you know, I've done 168 podcast episodes or something. And I realized that um, there's a lot of content in those podcasts that I can turn into newsletters. Right. So now I've started just pumping out a newsletter every week. The content's already been created and um yeah, there's just another way to not everyone wants to listen to a podcast and a LinkedIn newsletter is a, a good way just to sort of be, I guess, front of mind um, with with different people. And yeah, so. Yeah. Cool. And understanding that content is is omnidirectional, like you you make one video, you can transcribe that video and now it becomes another piece of content and you can take snips of that video and now it becomes short form content. So 
you know, you, you may be on, like, for example, we're on a call for an hour, but from this one hour of content, we can extrapolate this out and make hundreds and hundreds of pieces of content if we really wanted to. Right. So, you know, and you know this better than I do. I mean, that, that it's, it's just super powerful when you get into a schedule and a rhythm of actually creating something on a regular basis. So it's just yeah. about that discipline um, is kind of what we've talked about throughout this whole, whole entire podcast. So, yeah, it's been, I, I, I want to say, you know, I've, I've like, we, we came into contact in 2020 and just, you know, watching what you've achieved in this area has been phenomenal. Um, so congratulations. And I think that you are a, um, a great um, role model for other people who are, you know, looking to do big things in this industry. So congratulations. I appreciate it. And same to you. I mean, I, I constantly follow what you're doing and I'm always excited to engage with what you're doing. And so I'm, I'm just super appreciative that you're willing to stop by today to talk with the audience because I know that they gain some value. And uh, so for those individuals who want to get in touch with you, want to follow along with your journey and really engage with you long-term, what, what type of, I guess, what would you recommend oh, yeah. they do? Um, so if you're a leader, go to CREsuccess.co slash growth. And there's a free business growth guide for uh, owners and for leaders of commercial real estate businesses. Um, and if you are an individual, you can go to CREsuccess.co slash chat GPT, all one word, and you can grab a free chat GPT guide that I've created for commercial real estate agents and brokers. Um, otherwise, I'm assuming that, you know, we're, we're, when this is shared on, or this is being shared on LinkedIn because it's live, right? So I'm probably tagged in the post. So yeah, just hit me up on LinkedIn and happy to have a chat. Absolutely. And we'll actually be distributing this on all different platforms. So if you guys are watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And also uh, we'll include Darren's contact information in the show notes as well. If you guys are listening to this in a podcast format, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you name it, we're on all the different platforms. It'll be in the description as well. So please, I encourage you guys to follow along with what Darren's doing because it's amazing stuff. And we're really just excited to follow your journey, my friends. So again, Thanks again so much, my friend. I appreciate you. Uh, happy December. I'll be there tomorrow. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have a great time. But thanks again, all everyone who who tuned in. We really appreciate all the support. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Please engage with us on the going forward. We invite speakers to come to this uh, meetup every other week to talk about a variety of different commercial real estate topics. So thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. We'll see you.